talked about, and that is all embodied in strength. So as we welcome again the Gospel Choir of Soweto that was founded 16 years ago, by the way, the dream of Beverly Breyer and her business partner, David Malvodzi, who unfortunately has passed, but this strength lives on in song as they share with you something so strong. Great. Glad to hear it. More on that later. In August of this year, I live full-time. I'm American, but I do live full-time in Dublin, Ireland. I have a 10-year-old daughter, and four years ago, I decided to move her out of the United States because of the incredible gun violence in the schools where I live. And in August, when I came back to participate in a leadership conference, in Florida, there was news that was making national, I'm sure international headlines too, about a US-based manufacturing company that was producing guns from a 3D printout. If you can imagine, we need more of those. From a 3D printout, white plastic guns could be made like that. And, and fortunately, a judge stepped in and 
at least for now, halted the production and sale of those 3D plastic printout guns. But needless to say, those descriptions, those instructions can be purchased online, and it's only a matter of time. Or is it? Because at the same time that that was happening, there was a certain person, an artist, who was motivated to make his own 3D printout. This 3D statue that I believe is making its way onto the stage right now is of a 17-year-old who will always be 17. Because this is the life-size replica of Joaquin Oliver, who at 17 years old was gunned down along with 16 other children, coaches, teachers. He will forever be 17, but he is not, ladies and gentlemen, a victim, as you might imagine. No, and he is much more than a statue. And so please, give your warm welcome and attention to the artist of this statue, who also happens to be Joaquin Guac's father, Manuel Oliver. Manny, please take the stage. Honorable Desmond Tutu, damas y caballeros, premiados de los años anteriores, nominados, gracias por permitirme estar aquí hoy. I'm going to do this in English, don't worry. <laughs> so, my name is Manuel Oliver. I am Joaquin Oliver's dad. And Let's be very clear here. Our son is a victim of gun violence that became an activist. And we are very proud of what he does every single day for other kids. It was like two years ago that um, let me get cl closer to him. Okay. It's like two years ago that I was having a conversation with Joaquin. He was a deep thinker. Joaquin, uh, every time you had a conversation with Joaquin, there was music involved. It was like a soundtrack of a movie that somehow will merge with the conversation. And I don't remember exactly what we were listening to. It could be classic rock or hip hop, whatever. Um, he started talking about uh, how do we want to be remembered once we die? Where did that come from? You're 17 years old, 16 years old. What, why do we need to talk about that? So he started it. Dad, how do you want to be remembered when you die? All right, I guess I want to be remembered as a cool person that loves painting and motorcycles and, and have fun with your future kids and your sister's future kids and be a happy grandfather and I'll be happy with that and that's good. It's good enough for me. What about you? How do you want to be remembered? He said, I want to be remembered like John Lennon, like Muhammad Ali. He was getting better at that. 
I want to be remembered big. Making good things for people. So everyone will remember me and remember my name. So wow, you got to work a lot on that. He said, I got it. I got it. You don't have to worry about that. That day, I knew there was an activist soul inside my son. He was right there ready to have any battle in any place and challenge anybody. Early this year, on February 14th, Valentine's Day, Love Day, Friendship Day. And every time I talk about this day, I like to talk about the day before, the night before February 14th. The night before February 14th, Joaquin Oliver, El Enano, which is how I used to call him. Um, somebody was telling me last night that we have a lot of nicknames at home. And we do, we, we like nicknames. We, Cosi, Mimo, Monchi, Enano, it's cute, right? So I used to call him El Enano. Any one of you here don't know what Enano means? It means short guy, short dude. It makes no sense now, but when he was four years, five, six, all the way until 14, maybe he was El Enano. So I used to come back from the office, Enano, and shout it really loud. And he would run and hug me and kiss me, and, and my family had that love that all families need. We had it home. We had it. So the night before, Elenano told me, Dad, can we buy some flowers for tomorrow so I can bring them to Victoria, his girlfriend? I said, of course. So we went to buy the flowers. He was making sure that he would choose the right flowers, little and small, yellow sunflowers. He took the whole bouquet of flowers. We bring it home. We put them together in a nice way. We place them in water so they will be fresh tomorrow morning. Tomorrow morning, we woke up on February 14th. He got the flowers. He got his headphones. He got his cell phone, of course. And then I left him in school. I said, I love you, son. He said, I love you, too. And I don't want to make a sad story long. I want to make it very short. He got shot four times. Bang, 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 bang. And died. Not before giving the flowers to his girlfriend. So his last act in this world was a beautiful, kind action of giving flowers. We were devastated. We didn't know what to do. You lose the engine that moves your life. There is nothing worse than losing a son or a daughter. Nothing. And we were going through that. My daughter was going through the whole thing behind losing her brother. We were asking questions. You don't, you don't get an answer. Nobody can give you an answer that will make you an answer. Nobody can give you an answer that will make you feel better. So a friend of mine that he happens to be here, Jose, asked me to go to a parents meeting, pa parents meeting in Parkland. Local parents, they were gonna meet together because their kids were putting some movement together to fight against gun violence. I was sure, let's go. It was me and my wife were able to meet all these parents of these kids. And they were introducing themselves, one after the other. And I remember holding hands with Patricia, waiting for our turn to let them know who we were. And that was a before and after in what we do together. 
I remember us saying, we are Joaquin Oliver's parents, and we belong to this group, because our son is an activist and not a victim. And it felt good, and we were welcome back there. And then we met the kids. So we were invited to a meeting of the kids. That's a privilege, by the way. If you are 22 years old, older than that, you're not invited. You're not welcome, <laughs> period. We were invited. Me and Patricia were the only adults welcome to the meeting. Yeah, it's funny, but true. So we got there, and there's all these kids, like 30 of them running from one side, it was in Matt's house. I remember that. Running all around, oh, we're gonna do this and that, and talking about politics. I didn't understand half of it, but I like it. I said, this is great. Finally, we met a group of people that is actually doing something. We met politicians before that, we met leaders from different parties and positions. This was the right place to be. I remember Matt to put some order in the whole meeting, it was a dog toy, and he would squeeze it. <laughs> and everybody would stay calm. What a great way to have a meeting. I'm going to do this in my office. <laughs> so that was great. And then they were talking about a big march. Yeah, let's do a march in Washington. Yeah. And it happened. Thousands of people were there. We witnessed that. It was awesome. And then summer arrived, and they decided to go on tour, like a rock band. Let's go everywhere, yeah. Let's talk to people, go to these people, and talk to people. And we were behind them, like groupies. Like, yeah, let's go, let's go with them. And, and I saw the Portland kids turning into March for Our Lives. And, and that was only getting better and better every single day. They decided at some point you decided at some point that people should get registered to vote. You decided, you push it forward, and you succeeded. Then you decided that people should go ahead and show and vote on election day, and you push it and you move it forward, and you succeeded. And then you decided that you could be an option for parents like Patricia and myself to feel better, to find a light on that nightmare. And guess what? You succeeded. Because that's how we feel today. And that, my friends, kids, family, it's priceless. You are the reason why Patricia and I find power in life. And there is no way to pay that back. Joaquin Oliver is officially a member of March for Our Lives. And I'm so proud of that. He's with you. He will always be 17 years old. What does that mean? He will always be fighting like a 17-year-old. He's going to be ready, straight. Stop. Right? Joaquin will always be remembered like John Lennon and like Muhammad Ali. He will be remembered big, like you guys, because he's going to do good things for people. Joaquin was able to give the flowers to Victoria on Valentine's Day. Joaquin now gives flowers to everybody. His presence will be everywhere. He is also a peacemaker, and he's a very effective activist. And that is why he's here tonight. 
I'm going to take advantage of my situation right now. And I'm going to ask Mr. Desmond Tutu a personal favor. And you can do it from where you are right now. I need you to bless Joaquin's sculpture. Because that will give him more power for what he's fighting ahead of his whole movement. So your blessing means a lot for us as a family, for Joaquin and his legacy, and for March for Lives. It's an honor to be here, guys. And this is just the beginning because we're going to make this happen. You, the young people, take care of your future. You can build this. You have a white blank canvas. Let's draw it the right way. And us, the adults, let's empower them. Let's join them and be part of this. I love you, Patricia loves you, Andrea loves you. We love everybody here. <laughs> and Joaquin loves you a lot. Thank you very much. Andrea walks, mom, and big sister Andrea and Patricia are also here. So to the men, to the Manny, and to the Oliver family, another round of applause. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, as Manny so eloquently said, Joaquin is a peacemaker. He's an advocate for change. He's a representation, a reminder how important it is to be determined, to be strong, to not give up, to face in adversity, in, in, ad, in adversity and continue to be strong. And as the stagehands will be removing Joaquin, I want to let you know that he's going to be put into the reception He'll be joining us for the reception. So you may take photos with this activist and continue to be inspired by what he is doing as a change maker and as an, act and as an activist. Thank you again, Manny. <laughs> and ladies and gentlemen, the Cape Town Philharmonic Orchestra as conducted so masterfully by maestro Brandon Phillips has been a versatile and the most active orchestra in Africa since ince its inception in 1914. So as we're reflecting about the stories of these amazing activists, please reflect, get inspired also by their performance of Edward Edgar's Nimrod.
Ladies and gentlemen, the Cape Town Philharmonic Orchestra. In a world that has such disappointing, anger-causing, frustrating statistics as the ones you saw there, but yet also has such glorious, inspirational music and such inspired, determined voices and people who are making a difference, from nine years old to more than nine years old. <laughs> and everywhere in between. This is the power of determination, of strength, yes, of anger, but also of hope that together, with support from champions of change makers, foundations like kids' rights, that we can come together and make our world a better place. And so with that impressive performance, and I hope your hearts are moved and ready for our moment in this ceremony to award this year's International Children's Peace Prize as we've said and as Gail Johnson explained so as we've said and as Gail Johnson explained so well it's named the Inkosi because it does represent how one child one change maker can move the world and it every year for the past 14 years has been uniquely constructed by acclaimed artist Inga Inkink, with a child put, positioned on a different part of the world that represents the country and the continent that the change maker is from, yes? And this is the symbol that demonstrates the passion and the commitment of the people who win it. So for more, on the International Children's Peace Prize. Please give your attention to this following video. The International Children's Peace Prize is an initiative of the Dutch Kids' Rights Foundation. Every year, this prize is awarded to a child who bravely fights for children's rights anywhere in the world. In 2005, the first Children's Peace Prize was posthumously dedicated to Nkosi. During his short life, he pleaded for the rights of HIV and AIDS-infected children. Uh, we are normal. We are human beings. The next year, former child slave Om Prakash received the prize for his unceasing work to combat child labor and liberate child slaves in India. Tandiwe from Zambia won the prize in 2007 because of her extraordinary effort for the right to education for all children. Maíra battles against violence in Vila Cruzeiro in Brazil. She was therefore awarded with the fourth International Children's Peace Prize. Maíra received the prize from Nobel Peace Laureate Desmond Tutu. Just look, just look, there's a little angel who goes and wipes the tears from God's eyes. Talvez querer paz seja o mais comum no cotidiano da favela de Vila Cruzeiro. Não somos dignos de pena. O mundo é digno de pena. Baruani from DR of Congo won the prize for his work promoting children's rights in the refugee camp in Tanzania where he lives. In 2010, Francia received the prize. She campaigns for the right to name and nationality of children in the Dominican Republic. 
Haley won the prize for her commitment to the rights of children with disabilities in South Africa. That um, disabled people can't physically voice what they need and what they deserve. And um, I can. Desmond Tutu, patron of kids' rights and the International Children's Peace Prize, honored the winner of 2012. Kez received the prize for helping street children in the Philippines. In 2013, the prize was awarded to 16-year-old children's rights activist Malala. I want to live in a world where education is valued in every corner of the globe and no one is excluded from it. Neha received the prize in 2014 for her inspiring work helping orphaned and underprivileged children in both India and the United States where she lives. My message to the world is to convert empathy into action and make a difference in other people's lives. On the 9th of November 2015, the prize was awarded to Abraham Keita. Keita leads the fight for children's rights and justice in Liberia. My dream is to see a world where every child will receive justice. Yeah! Let's go! In 2016, the prize was awarded to Kekesha Basu from the United Arab Emirates for her extraordinary work as an environmental activist. In 2017, Malala Yousafzai presented the prize to Mohammed El Junda. Mohammed is a Syrian refugee who fled to Lebanon with his family when life became too dangerous at home. Determined to fight for the right to education, he started a school in a refugee camp. This school now teaches 200 children. The Children's Peace Prize is not only a sign of recognition for these young winners. Kids' Rights offers them a platform to promote their message, reaching hundreds of millions of people worldwide. They set a great example of how children can move the world. How humbling is it to be among these kids, these young people, these change makers? I can tell you from where I stand, it is a mighty humbling experience. Please give a round of applause once again for the dedication. And this International Children's Peace Prize was the brainchild of a former media mogul who didn't have to do something like this. But he told me that one day as he was in his office, some of his people, his producers, his news journalists said, come with us to the field. And he went to Sierra Leone in the midst of its war. And as they were driving in the field, he heard what he described was a cry that sounded like an animal, but it wasn't an animal, was it? It was a woman who apparently was walking with her 11-year-old daughter in her arms, trying to get her to a refugee camp, and the daughter had died. And Mark Delart told me this morning that that was it for him. He called his wife and said, we need to make a change. And I hope he doesn't mind me sharing the story as I introduce him, but that is the heart of someone who says, I'm selling my business, I'm starting the Kids' Rights Foundation. And in the 15 years since its inception, not only has it awarded incredible change makers, but it has changed the lives through the awareness with the partnership of ABN AMRO to affect the lives 
of millions of people worldwide who are now listening to us and hopefully will even listen to us, not just in live streaming, but as you share it and you talk this up. And it's 100,000 euro fund that comes with the award will be then dedicated to the projects that are in the hearts and the areas of dedication of its winners. More than 100,000 children's lives have been directly impacted so far by the hearts of the winners combined with the support of the Kids' Rights Foundation. So ladies and gentlemen, it just keeps getting more inspirational. And I do hope that you will join me in welcoming the founder and chair of Kids' Rights Foundation, Mark Dulard. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. I did, it, I did this all together with my wife, uh, Inge, also here. Please, Inge, stand up. Give her also an applause. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, it's a privilege and a pleasure to present you this year's finalist for the International Children's Peace Prize 2000. 18. And of course, a special welcome to the Children's Peace Prize winners, our patron Desmond Tutu, Mrs. Leia Tutu, and his family. And of course, the 2018 winner. Okay, they're all here. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Ladies and gentlemen, this year, 121 courageous children from 45 countries across the globe were nominated. Together, they defend the rights of children from pressing global challenges, including education, violence, peace, child participation, gender equality, and the environment. And they are all remarkable change makers. Kids' Rights is really proud of all these nominees and thrilled to present to you the 2018 finalist. The first finalist is Moni Begum, a 17 years old girl from Bangladesh. She became an activist against child marriage at the age of nine after her sister was forced to marry a much older man who abused her. She had rescued more than 200 girls from child marriage and also established a support system with her own organization, which issues microloans to families to pay for their daughter's education. Far more useful to families, in her view, than early marriage. The second finalist are the initiators of the March for Our Lives movement, David Hawk, Emma Gonzalez, Jacqueline Corrin, Matt Dites, alongside more than 20 other American students, Delany Tarr, Ryan Deitch, Trevon Buzzi, and of course, the statue is not here, Jogan Oliver. They mobilized thousands of young people to march, to register to vote. And since its advent, over 25 states have passed more than 50 pieces of legislation consistent with the cause for the March for Our Lives. And these young students say, there's no age restriction on fighting for justice and peace. We cannot afford to be bystanders when the cost of silence is life 
or dead. And the choice to act can be stripped in an instant. The third finalist and last finalist is La Luna Lino, an 18 years old girl from Samoa, raped by her father at a very young age. She had the courage to stand up in court and in public to report the sexual abuse she faced as a child. Through her awareness raising efforts in primary schools across Samoa, she inspired many more children to report the abuse. She created also peace gardens that help hundreds of children to recover from trauma. And she speaks to them about her journey and the importance of finding inner peace. On finding inner peace and putting it to good use, Lelua says, why should I turn against the whole world because of what I've lost? I'm now at peace and I share the gift of peace with the abused children of Samoa by being their voice. Ladies and gentlemen, these young change makers are an example to all of us. They were all moving the world like the Children's Peace Prize statuette expresses and show us that youth can bring positive change and that we simply have to listen to them. In 10 minutes from now, we will celebrate this year's extraordinary International Children's Peace Prize winner. But we also celebrate 10 years of patronship of Desmond Tutu, patron of the International Children's Peace Prize and Kids' Rights. As we all know, Father is one of the most respected spiritual and political leaders of our time. And he's a historic change maker. And that is a long and impressive story. But today, I humbly would like to focus on the journey Father traveled together with kids' rights. Please allow me to share with you some highlights. First of all, I'd like to thank Father for his wisdom. When the Kids' Rights Foundation just got started 15 years ago, and I had the opportunity to explain to Father what our idea was, I was very elaborate and used far too many words. But Father took the time to listen, and finally only gave one remark. I still remember it. He summarized my dream in only, in only 10 words. He said with this beautiful African voice, Oh, you want to give a voice to the voiceless? <laughs> At that moment, the Kids' Rights purpose was born, not knowing that in the following years, the Children's Peace Prize would give youth a platform to voice their rights to millions of people worldwide. For 10 years, Father's extraordinary talent to use the right words at the right time, inspiring people of all ages around the world, has not only graced our ceremonies, but his words have also brought the essence of why we should celebrate the resilience of youth and how we should embrace the inventiveness of children. During his speech in 2012, in front of all the cameras, Desmond Tutu said to the world, hey, you oldies, listen, 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 listen to the children and act. The message was crystal clear and resonated like a mantra. Everybody spoke about it and it was quoted everywhere. And in 2008, everyone, as you just saw in the little clip, was in tears 
when father said to the winner, Maya, a young girl from Brazil, look at her, look at her. She's an angel, a little angel, wiping the tears from God's eyes. Historic and impressive words that have significantly contributed to the development of the Children's Peace Prize and to the prestigious prize that it is today with worldwide reach and a great impact for children's rights. And finally, I want to thank Father for his contagious energy. People are still talking about your spontaneous tutu shuffle during the 2014 award ceremony. <laughs> when you were in dancing in front of our King Willem Alexander, and frankly, in front of the entire world. And of course, finally, your incredible sense of humor. When students at the Erasmus University in Rotterdam ask you how one, become, how one could become a Nobel Peace Laureate, you answered, well, you need to have a simple name, easy to pronounce, like Tutu, and you need to have a big nose and long, sexy legs like me. <laughs> Dear Father, thank you on behalf of all the Children's Peace Prize winners and the Kids Rest Foundation for being our patron and for undeniably supporting our cause and for doing so with unique gusto. Thank you.